The Polsky Practical Personal Enrichment Series is underwritten by the Polsky Family Supporting Foundation in partnership with the Johnson County Community College Foundation, which seeks to educate and empower the public in the areas of health, financial independence, and topical issues not covered elsewhere. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Johnson County Community College and welcome to the Polsky Theater. My name is Christy McWard. I am Director of Marketing and Event Management here at the college and we are so pleased to have you here with us for tonight's Polsky Practical Personal Enrichment Series Lecture, Making Hope Happen, featuring Dr. Shane Lopez. In a few moments, Dr. Lopez will join us to talk about hope and how our capacity to hope impacts our overall well-being, our health, our happiness, and our success in academics, in relationships, in our careers. There may be no better topic or speaker to kick off our 2013-14 Polsky Series season. The Polsky Practical Personal Enrichment Series was established in 1997 and is underwritten by the Norman and Elaine Polsky Supporting Family Foundation in partnership with the JCCC Foundation. The series seeks to educate and empower the public in the areas of health, financial independence, and other topical issues not covered elsewhere. There is a booklet in your packet that you received. If you did not get a packet when you came in, please raise your hand and one of our ushers will bring it around to you. But you have a booklet in your, in your packet where you can read more about Norman's vision for the series and the remarkable contributions that he and Elaine have made to Johnson County Community College and to our community at large. We are very honored tonight to have several members of the Polsky family here with us. Um, I can see you're out, out there. Wave or stand up, guys. Let's give them a hand for their support. Very briefly, I want to tell you a little bit about the other things that are in your packet. First of all, you have a green card. This is for your feedback. We really, really appreciate hearing from you. We want to know if you like tonight's lecture, what else you'd like to see, what topics, what speakers. Please let us know. We're always planning future events, and we want to do this for you and keep it interesting. So please give us that feedback. And also, if you'd be so kind as to give us your contact information, we can keep you informed of new events that we're planning all the time. The other card in your packet is the blue card. And tonight, after Shane's presentation, we will have a moderated question and answer session. And we would like you to be the question askers, OK? So we want you to fill out questions as he's speaking. Think of anything you want to ask. Write it on your card and hand it to an usher. And an usher will bring it down to us. And we will put those cards in the capable hands of my colleague, Debbie Eisenhower. Debbie, please stand up. Debbie is our HR staff development coordinator here at Johnson County Community College. And she will be moderating that question and answer session with Shane a little bit later. Also in your packet is a, is a flyer for next month's Polsky series. Four weeks from tonight, Wednesday, October 9th, we have Kara Filler coming. She is a motivational speaker on the national circuit, and she's going to come and talk to parents and grandparents about teenagers and straight talk about teens and how to help them have self-esteem, make good choices, and really the topic is fascinating. It's be a parent first and a friend second. And I have two teenage boys, I can't wait for it, so that'll be fun. And then the other thing, this is not a Polsky event, but we hope you can make it, it's very exciting. We have Deepak Chopra coming in November. He will be here on November 14th. He is also on a book tour, and um, those tickets are on sale now. He will be in Yardley Hall November 14th. Tickets are on sale, and they include a copy of his new book. And um, we are pleased to say he's only going to a few cities on this tour, and Kansas City is one of maybe five. 
and Johnson County Community College is that spot where he will be. So that's very exciting for us. Um, be sure to check the Polsky Series website. We are adding new events all of the time, and we have all of our events planned from October, November, January, and March of next year. So check our website, www.jccc.edu slash Polsky Series for news and updates and information about those. Okay, oh, and you can also watch videos of previous Polsky Series. So if you miss one, you can always catch it in about two weeks on our website. Okay, let's bring out our speaker. Dr. Shane Lopez is a Gallup Senior Scientist in Residence and Research Director for the Clifton Strengths Institute. He is Chief Architect of the Gallup Student Poll, a measure of hope, engagement, and well-being that taps into the hearts and minds of students to determine what drives achievement. More than one million students have participated since its inception. Dr. Lopez is the world's leading researcher on hope. His mission is to teach people that investing in their future pays off today. He researches the links between hope, strengths development, academic success, and overall well-being, and collaborates with scholars around the world on these issues. He specializes in hope and strengths enhancement for students from preschool through college graduation, advocating a whole school strengths model that also builds the strengths expertise of educators, parents, and youth organizations. He is co-author of the statistical reports for the Clifton Strengths Finder and the Clifton Youth Strengths Explorer. A prolific author, Dr. Lopez has published more than 100 articles and eight books. His book, Making Hope Happen, det Happen, details how hope can be learned and spread to others. It was published in March of this year, and it will be on sale in the lobby outside of Yardley after the presentation. And Dr. Lopez will stick around and sign some copies after, too, as well. Dr. Lopez is a fellow of the American Psychological Association. He was a professor of psychology and education for a decade at the University of Kansas, where he is now a professor of business. Dr. Lopez lives in Lawrence, Kansas with his wife and son, and we are so pleased to have him here with us tonight. Please help me welcome Dr. Shane Lopez. Thank you all and welcome. It's, it's great to be here. The commute was tough. The trip in was harrowing, but here I am. Um, I have to start, I'm sorry to say, not talking about hope, but I'm um, talking about Deepak Chopra. Um, so I had dinner with Deepak. He's, he works with us at Gallup every now and then on projects, specifically projects around spiritual issues. And I had dinner with Deepak in Washington, DC. And of course, the first question on my mind was, how did you get to be friends with Larry King? OK? <laughs> so that, that was like the burning question. I've got to get an answer. Because if you look at those two guys, they just don't go together. They just don't go together. So I said, Deep, how do, so his friends call him Deep, so I call him Deep. I'm not his friend, but I call him Deep. Maybe he'll get confused and think I'm his friend. Um, I said, Deep, how did you get to be friends with Larry King? How did you then get to co-host or be a regular guest host on the show? Um, and how are you always on Larry King Live? So this is when Larry King Live was still on. And he said, you know, Larry has had a lot of wives. I said, I know that about Larry King. I'm always baffled as to why and how, but I know that about Larry King. He said, well, you know, Larry, after so many wives, you know, women wouldn't trust him so much. So he would give women he was interested in my phone number, and I would vouch for Larry King. I said, Deep, you're Larry King's wingman. He goes, yeah, I am. So when Deepak comes, please ask him about his friendship with Larry King. Um, so now I'm going to talk about hope. I've been researching hope for 17 years now. I used to be an IQ researcher, intelligence researcher. I then realized that a lot of the people who are very, very smart do very, very stupid things. And I started looking at what other variables accounted for success in life. Now, IQ has a little bit to do with success in school, a little bit to do with success at work, but nothing to do with success in relationships and nothing to do with happiness. So I was looking for something that would tell a bigger story about how we could lead our lives. 
Also, as you know, IQ is hard to influence. It's hard to shape your IQ over time after you get to be an adult. So I stumbled upon hope, and as you'll find out in the book, I, I stumbled upon it by working, number one, with incredible clients at the Leavenworth VA Medical Center who were looking for hope. And number two, I happened to be working with, at the time, the world's leading hope researcher. That was Rick Snyder at the University of Kansas. And he got the baton from Carl Menninger, who was the psychiatrist that started the Menninger Clinic. Carl wrote the first academic paper on hope in, I think, 1962. Rick picked up the baton, and then he passed it on to me. And I've been trying to make sense out of this thing called hope ever since. And then finally, after 17 years, I thought, eh, I know a little bit, so I wrote this book. So I'll tell you a little bit about what I know, but then I want you to help me fill in the gaps. Um, every day I learn something new about hope. So this morning, it's just the same thing. I'm learning something new about hope. I'm walking my son to school. My son's name is Parrish. He's eight. He's in the third grade. And we're walking to school, and he, he says, Dad, you know, we're going to the Niagara River soon. When are we doing that? I said, well, we're doing that next weekend. He goes, this weekend? You know, he's eight. Next weekend. Nine days from now, we're going to the river, and we're going to go canoeing. We're going to go fishing. And he goes, Dad, I've never been canoeing. And he gets all excited talking about this. Dad, I've never been fly fishing. He gets all excited talking about that. Now, he's eight. Now, his brain... Okay, his brain is somewhat developed, but the frontal lobes in his head are kind of like jello. Okay? So they're still under development. The frontal lobes of your brain develop until you're about 30 years old. So they're still going through a lot of changes. And what I was marveling at is this eight year old can cast himself into the future. He can cast himself into the future. And he was telling me stories about a place he's never been. He was telling me stories about something he's never done. He's imagining a future. More than that, he's creating memories of the future. Memories of the future. Now think about that. I just love saying it. Memories of the future. So our brains are equipped not just to reflect on the past and kind of roll up the memories that we have of past events, but to actually create memories of the future. I was talking to Debbie today, who will do Q&A a little bit later, and Debbie was telling me stories about her daughter's upcoming wedding. How many times have you relived that wedding already? And it's never happened. We create these memories of the future, and what happens next is that, well, the brain, while we like white space, we do, we really appreciate white space. In fact, that's why that FedEx logo is so interesting to us, because that Im little embedded arrow that's kind of built into to the FedEx logo. We like white space, but we do try to make sense out of it. We try to accommodate it. Sometimes we try to fill it. So when we create memories of the future and then juxtapose those thoughts with where we are right now and how we live, we're living our lives right now, we try to fill the gap. We try to fill the gap. And our mind automatically says, how can I get from where I am right now in the present to where I want to be in the future? And then we come up with multiple ways to get from point A to point B. So basically what hope is, is about creating these memories of the future, coming up with all these plans to get from point A to point B, but then you have to combine that with this spirit, this drive, this efficacy, this belief that you can do these things. And those are the different pieces of hope. So I'll try to demystify hope a little bit more over the course of the next six hours that you'll be here. And <laughs> And then by 1 a.m., you'll be like, I know what it is. Let's go. Let's get out of here. No more Larry King stories. Um, but first, I'm going to tell you about this guy. Now, there is one person in the room who should know who this guy is. And he's sitting right over there in a purple shirt. And he's thinking, I don't know who that guy is. All right. So think back when you left St. Peter's Church in New Iberia, Louisiana, and you passed by Iberia Bank. You remember this guy standing out there? Okay. He remembers. This is my friend Judd. We went to high school together. And don't ask any more questions. Um, <laughs> so this statue stood outside the bank in New Iberia, Louisiana, while we were growing up. And I was always curious about this statue because it was really, it didn't really fit. I mean, New Iberia, Louisiana was, is, and forever will be a town of 35,000 people. Okay? It is, um, it is an interesting, wonderful gritty place that we love so much. 
but this statue doesn't really fit in. Okay, so I was always curious, how did this statue come to be in New Iberia, Louisiana? So if you're wondering where New Iberia is, go south and keep on going south till you start smelling the Gulf of Mexico. That's pretty much where New Iberia is. So I looked into it, and what happened is the owner of Iberia Bank in the 50s, and you're thinking, is this another Larry King story? No, I'll come back to Hope in a second. The owner in the 50s went to New Orleans, went to an auction, and paid $1,500 for this statue. Had it shipped to Iberia Bank, and then put it in the bank. I don't know if you have any friends who run, run banks or own banks. Anything their wives or husbands won't let them keep at home, they put in the bank, okay? So it's in the bank for a long time. The bank grew and grew and grew because we were oil rich for a while, and they decided we have to put the statue outside the bank. So they built a little, well, they poured a little concrete slab and they glued the statue to it, and it was right outside the bank, right near the street, right near the sidewalk. So this statue, oh, by the way, do you know who this guy is? He's a builder of walls. Hadrian, Hadrian, Emperor Hadrian. So, okay, here's the link, all right? Hadrian is Spanish, born in Iberia. Oh, now, yeah. He was born in southern Spain near on the Iberian Peninsula, and hence we thought we needed him in New Iberia. Um, so this statue is out there, and this is before Judd and I were old enough to really appreciate what the teenagers were doing, but the teenagers, every Saturday night slash Sunday morning, would adorn Hadrian. They'd go out, they'd have maybe a few adult beverages before they were of age, and then they'd adorn Hadrian with lays, they'd put lays around Hadrian's neck. Every now and then you'd see a toga on Hadrian, like a sheet, I'm thinking that's so redundant. He's already got, you know. But then beer cans in his hand. Um, and then someone, Paul Schwing, um, he owns Paul's Flower Shop, if you ever need flowers in New York, Louisiana. He said, you know what, this might be worth some money. We ought to have it insured. And the bank said, yeah, you're probably right. What if a car, you know, jumps the curb and it's, it's totaled? So a guy came over and said, actually from Schwing Insurance Agency, you see where I'm going with that. Um, Schwing came over and said, you know what? I don't deal with antiquities. And the bank guy said, hey, we bought it not that long ago for not that much money. Um, I just insured for like 10 grand, we're good. He goes, I can't write the policy because I'm pretty sure, sure it's an antiquity. So he said, I'll call a guy over from New Orleans, he'll drive over, we'll know tomorrow. Guy drives over from New Orleans, looks at the statue. It's like, oh, we found Hadrian. Yeah, what do you mean we found Hadrian? Well, the owner of the bank bought Hadrian, didn't leave any contact information. We didn't know he was the owner of Iberia Bank. He left New Orleans. We didn't know where Hadrian went. Hadrian is almost 2,000 years old. Hadrian is worth $1 million. Yeah. All of a sudden, with what I call Cajunuity, we just <laughs> threw up some glass panels around this guy, and he was protected from everything, right? Because glass will stop a car. <laughs> we actually moved him, as Judd remembers, we moved him like 30 feet. We threw up some glass panels and a nice little, little dome on top of him to make him feel at home. And um, that was it. And then... During high school, our rich little town became a poor little town because the oil boom turned into an oil bust and people were selling stuff left and right, including the bank. And the bank went to New York City and sold Hadrian for $1 million. So I'm on this quest now to find Hadrian. That's all I do. I don't do anything else at work. <laughs> I'm just Googling, where is Hadrian? So, you're thinking, what does this have to do with hope? I'm th Here's what it has to do with hope. This was the oldest, most beautiful, most valuable thing in our little town. And we didn't appreciate it. We didn't appreciate it. We didn't attend to it. We didn't celebrate it. We didn't love it. We didn't use it in a meaningful way. And that's how we treat hope. 
That's how we treat hope. It is an ancient virtue alongside other virtues like faith and love that get us through life. And I think, I think we make fun of it, we mock it, we joke about it because we confuse it with other things that are like hope, like wishing, like wishing. So, you know, all of us want a little rain, we want a little relief from this heat. Who's saying, oh, I hope it rains tonight? I hope it rains tonight. But no, actually you wish, because if you hoped, you would do something about it. And in that situation, there's not much you can do about it. So we really should be better about our, our choice of language, because hope suggests that we're actually willing to do something about the situation. So when someone says to me, oh, I hope that goes well for you, I'm thinking, and what will you do to help? Because now you're telling me you're invested in my future. You want to be part of my future, and you're going to help me get from point A to point B. So Hadrian's taught us so many lessons, and I really, I really do want to find him. He, he started his life on... Um, well, in, in um, Spain, but then he was then purchased by um, an English lord, and he lived on one of those estates, like on Downton Abbey. And then he came to New Orleans and New Iberia, and now we just don't know where he is. The auction house won't release that information, so we're, we're hiring a team of private eyes to find Hadrian. Um, <laughs> so I've told you a little bit about what hope's not. It's not wishing. It's not wishing. Don't confuse it with wishing. So what is it? Well, it's half optimism. It's half optimism. Optim optimism is the belief that the future will be better than the present. The belief that the future will be better than the present. Now at Gallup, we do three amazing polls. One is the Gallup student poll. So every October, every school in the country can turn on the Gallup student poll and test the hope, engagement, and optimism, hope, engagement, and well-being of its students. So if you're affiliated with a school, if you drive past the school, do what you can to get that school to turn on this poll because it's free. There is no cost associated with it, and you can find out about the hope, engagement, and well-being of these students in your town. We also do the Gallup Nightly Poll. So right now we have call centers around America calling um, a bunch of folks to get 500 to 1,000 answers to a whole bunch of questions that we analyze every morning. And then we do the Gallup World Poll, which is, voila, right there. We ask about 70 questions in every country every year. 70 questions of a representative sample of, of people in that country. And we use all sorts of techniques. If you want to talk about hope, our guy Bob Tatora goes to Africa and he has to find people. Not, oh, I'm going to go into a neighborhood and knock on doors. He has to use heat sensing, heat mapping, and go find people to interview in certain parts of Africa that aren't densely populated. So we've asked this question, do you believe the future will be better than the present, around the world, and what we found is that almost 90% of people on the planet are optimistic. Almost 90%. They believe that the future will be as good or better than the present. They're leaning towards the future. They think something good's gonna happen in their lives. Now, I said optimism is half of hope. The other half, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you've got to create, fill this white space and come up with plans to get from point A to point B and then have that efficacy to get there. That's the other half of hope. When we factor that in, only 50% of people on the planet are hopeful. Only half. So we're very optimistic, very optimistic. Somewhat confident, but we don't necessarily have the ways to make our lives better. And we learn that most keen, you know, it, it's in sharpest relief with kids. When we poll kids, well, in fact, when the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, polls kids using this PISA, which is this national assessment test that tells us we, we stink at math and science, that one, um, they found that Americans are number one in one category. You remember what that is? Confidence. We have the most confident young people in the world, but they're not doing so well in math and science. Um, <laughs> and it's because they don't know the ways. They don't know how to get from point A to point B. So on the Gallup Student Poll, we find out again and again, students are begging to be taught ways to make things happen in their lives. 
So what we know is that almost 90% of people are optimistic. Only half of them are hopeful. It's not a confidence issue by and large. It's a, hey, I don't know how to do this thing. I don't know how to solve a problem. I don't know how to ask for help. And that's where we can really make a difference when we're trying to spread hope to other people. Now, what do people hope for? Think about that question. Every year we ask this question around the world, what are your hopes and dreams for the future? So you might, if you're taking notes, write down your answer, or take a mental snapshot. What are your hopes and dreams for the future? Anybody want to call out a, an answer? Good health, definitely on the top five. Interesting work, more money, safer world. You guys don't have a lot of hopes and dreams. <laughs> These five people do. They're doing okay. Um, in the top five, in almost every country around the world, a good job and a happy family. A good job, meaningful, interesting work, and a happy family loving people to spend my life with. Now, we ask this question, and it's open-ended, and then, which means you can say anything you want, and then out of the thousands of responses we get, we hand those responses over to a group of coders who read through the responses, cluster them into categories, and come up with as few as wor words as possible to describe all the findings. And we have about 13 clusters, and these are always in the top five, okay? But I want you to know, people are not saying, you know, in Chile, they're not saying, I want a good job. They're saying meaningful work. I want to do something with my skills. I want to, so they're, they're using longhand, and we have to write it up in shorthand. Happy family, again, is just loving people to spend your life with. Loving people to spend your life with. Now, to focus on schools for another minute, we think that kids go to school and people come to Johnson County Community College, and folks come to the KU Business School, I'm getting all my plugs in, okay, um, because they want a degree. They want to do well in school and get a degree. And frankly, that's bull. People go to school because they one day want to have a good job or a happy family, and a happy family. And these visions of the future, what we find is that if you tell a compelling story about the future, it pulls you forward. Psychologically, it moves you from point A to point B. It keeps you moving in the right direction along all these pathways that you develop. So this good job and happy family are two things we should know about everybody in our lives. What does your good job look like? What does your happy family look like in the future? What do you want? So Parrish right now, my eight-year-old, his good job, and I actually love this idea. He wants to own a po' boy shop with his dad. I love that. Number one, I love po' boys. Number two, I love him. So this would be ideal. Ideal. Now that's changed. That's changed over time. That vision has changed. Sometimes he wants to be a coder, so he wants to um, program. Sometimes he wants to be an athlete. Sometimes he wants to be a doctor. Well, not really a doctor, but... You know, he wants to help people in different ways. Um, so that's changed. Now, his, question, his answer to happy family has not changed since he was three years old. Not once. Parrish, you're going to have a family one day? Oh, yeah, Dad. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have a family. I said, so you're going to be married? He goes, I'm going to marry a wife, and we're going to have. So I'm like one of the few straight men in my family, so we actually have to clarify these things, <laughs> all right? So... I'm going to marry a wife. It was like, okay, now we kind of know where you're leaning. Um, and I said, well, what will she look like? And I'm thinking he's going to say, well, she's going to look like mom and yada, yada, yada. She's going to have dark hair. And my wife has blonde hair. And Debbie earlier said, well, you know, he can't find a blonde as good as your wife, so he's looking for a dark hair woman. Maybe. Um, so he's looking for a dark-haired wife and four kids. He's an only. <laughs> he's kind of lonely. He's a lonely only. Um, so he's looking for more people in his life. This image pulls him forward. 
he sits every now and then, he'll bring a friend over and he goes, what kind, what kind of po' boys do you like? <laughs> and the first question is, what's a po' boy? <laughs> well, it's like a sub, but good. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, okay, I got you. So he'll talk about that. And he is, he's creating memories of the future. Folks can do that starting at age two. At age two. So at age two, you can project yourself into the future. You can start putting together these if-then contingencies, which I think should be taught in every school in America. How do you put if and then together? And then you can start telling, as language develops, tell a story where you are the superhero in that story. That's hopeful thought right there. Okay? So these are the two things that pull us forward. Desperately, desperately, we should know these things about everyone we care for. If you're a teacher, you should know these things about all your students. If you're a manager, you should know these things about all your employees. You should know what people want from their future, and you should know how you could maybe help them get there. Okay, we'll come back to spreading hope in a bit. Hope matters. Gosh, you know, this is, you know, I started studying intelligence. I can give you a test, and I got really good at it, so it's a long test, but I had it down to giving it to people in about 50 minutes. I could give you an IQ test, and then I could give you a number and tell you what your IQ was. Plus or minus, usually about three points. Hope is a little fuzzier, and that's okay. But it's actually more important than IQ. And what we found by studying hope, and this is over 50 different studies of hope as it is associated with academic outcomes, as it predicts and causes academic outcomes. So there are some causal studies, there's some correlational studies, there's some intervention studies, all woven into this narrative. But what we found out is that hope is worth about a letter grade in school. About a letter grade. And hope is not related to IQ. In fact, in the studies we've done, there's a zero correlation between hope and IQ. Zero, not, not like 0 .07, it's 0, .00. There's no correlation. The other piece you need to know is that there's no correlation between hope and income. Hope and income. And I share this result sometimes with, with uh, foundations who are funding programs in impoverished areas. And they're like, oh, no, if you met the kids we work with every day. I said, well, take a day off and go to that rich neighborhood over there and spend time with those kids. And you're going to see that there's hope impoverishment there too. And there's hope spikes there too, just like in your neighborhood. And in fact, that's the way hope works. It's an equal opportunity resource. And how many of those do we have? Now, are our institutions equal opportunity institutions? No. But this personal thing that you can build in your own life, even no matter what people throw at you, is equal opportunity. And it's worth a letter grade, so a 12% bump in school outcomes. For those of you in the world of business, running your own small business, running a big business, you're concerned about the bottom line. Hope is worth about a day a week out of a seven-day work week of productivity. Hope is worth about an hour a day of productivity to add up to that day a week. We've looked at this in Chinese factory workers. We've looked at this in Swiss mechanics. We've looked at this in, in um, bankers closing loans. You name it, hopeful people are more productive. Hopeful people are more productive. Now, why do you think that is? Why do you think this, this fuzzy thing, and I'll admit it's somewhat fuzzy, this fuzzy thing is potent? Why does it build productivity? Well, hopeful people are more creative. Hopeful people are more creative. There's this whole phenomenon called the broaden and build phenomenon. It's, it's a theory of positive emotions in psychology, and essentially what it says is, when you feel good, you take the blinders off and you see opportunity and possibility. When you feel lousy, fearful especially, you put the blinders on. You remember that old fight and flight story? You know, it's, oh, when you're scared, you can only do two things, fight or flee, that's it. Well, that comes from an actual study where they scared people and they watched what they did. So some people got ready to fight and some people got ready to flee, okay? Now, truth be told, only men were in that study. 
and later, <laughs> truly, later, Shelly Taylor, this wonderful psychologist at UCLA, uh, redid some of that work, and she found that women actually have more than two options because they will tend and befriend. And it's like, oh, you're, you're scared? Let me help you. Let me tend to you and befriend you. And men are just running away and fighting. Um, so it's real science. Um, but what we find is that when you experience positive emotions, and, and positive emotions are part of hope, when you experience positive emotions, there are four, five, six, seven things you want to go out and do. They're not just two things you can do, which are called in psychology terms specific action tendencies. When you experience positive emotions, you just open yourself up to what's possible. So that's why hopeful people are more productive in school and work, is that they're more creative. And we've done study after study looking at how hopeful people come up with solutions in difficult circumstances. And sure enough, hopeful people do two things different from less hopeful people. They come up with more solutions to complex problems, and they come up with more creative solutions to complex problems. Now, the more solutions, we look behind the data and we find that it's a hedging strategy. It's like, I don't, you know, I need as many pathways as I can. Because you may not like solution A, solution B might not work. So I'm going to throw out six or seven of these solutions. And some of them are going to be gems. They're going to be very creative, creative solutions. So that's why hopeful people are more productive, both at school and work. Now let's talk about why hope works. Why hope works. So I told you we're creating these memories of the future. So we're nexting, we're creating memories of the future, we're then filling in the gaps, we're adding our confidence to this. It's a compelling story. But, you know, I get to sit in on dissertations all the time. So either in the School of Business, in the School of Psychology, which is College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, or in the School of Education. And people love this hope work. You can imagine young people kind of kind of flock to doing this hope research. So I would sit on dissertations or chair dissertations, and my colleagues, you usually have five professors around a table and one student, and they're doing a lot of fighting and fleeing at the moment when they're defending their dissertation. But oftentimes, you know, we, we get these robust findings that, yep, hopeful people do better than less hopeful people. And we can talk about memories of the future and pathways and agency and all these different things. And the other faculty members are like, that's... Uh, I wish you could tell me more of the story. How does hope actually work? You know, so then we got into these brain studies to figure out what happens in the brain. So I'll give you two answers to how hope works. This one is, is really interesting to me right now because I'm just learning more and more about it. You know how you, you read a lot about neuroscience these days and some people are not so hot on it and some people are really interested in it. But you always hear these studies where, you know, I put this gentleman in an MRI chamber, and I asked him to solve math problems, okay? And then I put this lady in an M MRI chamber, and I asked her just to relax. Everybody with me? He's the experiment, she's the control. I, I look at what they do, and then I compare their brain scans, okay? So everybody was interested in how he solves math problems and how that relates to frontal lobe activity and what's going on. And no one really said, well, what are all these people doing when they're doing nothing? And then people started saying, maybe they're thinking about the future. Maybe they're daydreaming. And sure enough, they were daydreaming. They were thinking about the future. They were nexting. They were imagining. And by looking at this clump of folks, all the folks who were asked to do nothing, we found that there's a default network in the brain that's activated when we daydream when we think about the future. So what we know now is that the brain is built to think about the future. The brain is built to think about the future. We then control all the emotional signals that we get in different ways. And then finally, we execute on those visions in the frontal lobe. And we say, go, no go, down which pathway, how do I do that? So that default network helps us understand how hope works. But more than that, we've looked at study after study from all different areas of social science, and we found that when people get excited about the future, they behave differently today. So hear me out. 
I went to a school in middle school. I, I, instead of going to public school, my parents sent me to Catholic High School. Very, very fancy name, I know. Catholic High School. And the brothers there lived in, uh, believed in only one thing, delayed gratification. And they reminded us every day, you're going to suffer for a long time. But then one day, your life will be great. So just hang with us for a little while. We're all suffering together. And when you think about self-regulation and delayed gratification, that stuff actually works. To some extent, those of us, you remember uh, Michelle's marshmallow task? You know, you give kids, uh, little kids, a plate of marshmallows, and you basically ask them not to. I'm going to leave the room. Don't eat the marshmallows. <laughs> and if you hold off, I'll double the marshmallows when I come back. My kid would have been all over those marshmallows. But that delayed gratification actually does work to an extent. But the other half of the story is when we get excited about the future, we behave differently today. There was one study that comes to mind. Um, these folks went into a Detroit middle school science class. Now, if you want to talk about a hopeless place, I'm not banging on Detroit, but it's struggling, okay? Then middle school, probably the worst place you can be as a child is middle school. No, well, apologies to middle school teachers. Um, and then science class. You know, it's not the, take me to science class, I want to go. Um, it's not the place kids want to be. So they went into this, this class, and what they did is they, they did a recruiting speech to, I'm going to have you half over here, you guys got the recruiting speech, rah, rah, come to the University of Michigan, and life will be wonderful. And in fact, for every year you go to college, you make more money in your lifetime. And they showed a beautiful graph of how that works. So they connected education to your future to money, okay? Over here, same kids randomly assigned, same group of uh, kids randomly assigned. So your speech was come to the University of Michigan, rah, rah, you're going to love it. But some of you won't go to college. And that's okay because you might become a famous entertainer and make millions of dollars. And they showed a graph of the Forbes top entertainers, top earning entertainers, okay? And then the science teachers who were blind to this experiment, they come in and they were asked to do one thing, give all the students an extra credited assignment to turn in at the beginning of class tomorrow. That was it, okay? So everybody with me, you're randomly assigned to one of two conditions. You got the rah-rah speech, and hey, you'll make more money if you go to school. You got the rah-rah speech, and hey, if you don't go to school, you'll make a bazillion dollars. Okay? You'll be great. All right? So you guys were wishing, and you guys were hoping, essentially. Education was part of your story, part of your future. It wasn't part of your future. These guys were eight times more likely to hand in the homework the next day. Eight times more likely. Now, that's a huge finding, and it convinced me that how we psychologically invest in the future pays off today. Again and again and again. Now, the problem comes in when, with how long these effects last. So when we get people to psychologically invest in the future, that bump might serve them tomorrow and the next day. But then we have to somehow help them reinvest so they can get another bump. They can sustain that increase in change in productivity. But you know what's easier for most folks? Let's build a big program within schools that costs millions of dollars and doesn't work because then we have a building that serves the needs of our students. And frankly, we need fewer buildings and more people who invest in the future of others. And we'll talk about that as we talk about sharing hope. But what I want you to know is that followers need hope. And you all are here for a reason. You probably lead something. You lead a family. You lead a church. You lead a class. You lead a neighborhood. You lead something. And what I want you to hear is that followers need hope. Now, how do we know this? Well, we can point to lots of different stories um, across religious texts about how followers need hope. But we did a study because we're Gallup, so we called a bunch of people. In fact, we called 10,000 people. And we said, we want you to identify the most influential leader in your life. Okay, so think about that. Now, the first 5,000 people we called, 
we didn't say this next part. We didn't say who you have daily contact with. So for the first 5,000, when we looked at the results and then we looked at who people identified as their, their um, influential leader, we had a lot of religious figures. We had a lot of people who had passed away. We had a lot of historical figures. Okay? Now that's important data. But when you go sit down with a CEO, they may think they're God, but you don't want to reinforce that. Okay? <laughs> so CEOs want to know, what do my followers want? So we had to redo the study. And we had to ask people, who's your most influential leader that you have daily contact with? And then we got none of, no of, the, none of the historical figures or the religious figures. We got preachers, teachers, uh, bosses, neighborhood folks, you know, civic leaders, all kinds of folks. But what was interesting, when our, when our data folks mined all the, the, the words and aggregated all the data, what we found is that the results were the same across the two studies. So whether you're thinking about Jesus Christ or you're thinking about your sister who is a leader in your family, you have the same needs related to those folks, which is amazing to me. And the four things, the four needs are stability, trust, compassion, and hope. Stability, you're going you're gonna to be there. You're going to say the same thing today as you said yesterday. You know, you're just a stable figure. You're not going to disappear on me. And then to ramp that up on the emotional side of that is trust. I can trust you. I can, I can feel a connection to you. And what we learn now is that trust is, is part oxytocin. So there's kind of this, this neurochemical of trust called oxytocin that builds up when we're in a trusting relationship. Stability, trust, compassion, and hope. That's what leaders give us. That's how leaders follow us. That's why leaders follow us. Now think about the people who are following you. Are you meeting those four basic needs in them? That's a huge responsibility. That's just huge. But that's what folks need. Now, I'm going to relieve some of the pressure on you right now. Okay? Because we've also found over the last 10 years how social networks work. We figured that out. And we, meaning social scientists. And when I say social network, I'm not talking about Facebook and Twitter and all that good stuff. Um, I'm talking about your actual social network, real people connected to you in real life. What we found is demonstrated by these penguins. I just love penguins, by the way. That's really why they're on the slide. But fortunately, there are four of them. Your friends, friends, friend makes you hopeful. So hope spreads to the third degree. So hope goes from me to Christy to Debbie to the next person. She and I don't know each other. But my hope influences her hope over time. And you're like, how is that? I don't know. I wish I knew. But here's how we found this out. Nicholas Christakis, a physician and PhD, um, he joined forces with this epidemiology kind of guy, and, and they were looking for this perfect database that allowed them to track things across social networks. And what they found was this Framingham Mass longitudinal study, Framingham, Massachusetts longitudinal study of heart health. So they said, oh, this is a longitudinal study. It's wonderful. But they went to Framingham and they said, we're going to study the study and we're going to find out how we can find out how people are connected to one another. And they studied the charts and they were so disappointed by the end of the day, they couldn't figure out how person A is connected to person B, is connected to person C and person D. So Nicholas is leaving the office and he's kind of dejected and, and an assistant says, oh, doc, you didn't find what you're looking for? No, you know, I was looking for this, this story that might develop so we could test out how, how happiness and... and um, obesity and things kind of track over social networks, but I couldn't find out, for example, who was her best friend in Framingham, Mass., and who was her best friend in Framingham, Mass., and connect up the data. And the assistant says, oh, you want the blue sheets? He goes, yeah, I guess I want the blue sheets. So 
for every participant in the study for the last 50, 60 years, they've been keeping tabs on who that person's best friend was. And it wasn't in the file folder, it was in the top secret desk that the assistant kept because he had to call the people and ask them to come back for the study. So they got the blue sheets out, and what they found out is that your friend's friend's friend makes you fat. Your friend's friend's friend makes you hopeful. Your friend's friend's friend makes you happy. So this social network is amazingly powerful, but we're just learning more and more about it. Sure, modeling plays a role in it, absolutely, no doubt. But there, got, there has to be some other factors um, that, that are at work that play into how you're influenced by other people. Now, what's important to note is as, as a leader, you're influencing this last little penguin. But I want you to know, too, that last little penguin is influencing three other people, three other penguins. So there's this ripple that, that happens. I do have to tell you, this slide is a little confusing because animals, by definition, are not hopeful. Only humans are hopeful. And you may have this smart dog or this really persistent cat, and you're thinking, oh, they're so hopeful. <laughs> they're not. Okay, they don't have a frontal lobe, they can't be hopeful. All right, how do we become more hopeful? I'm gonna tell you a couple of ways, then we're gonna talk about spreading hope and then we'll kind of ease into some questions. Um, you know, really deciding what matters to you in your life, going after it whole hog and getting rid of the distractions, that's the basic response. Um, but the two easiest ways to help to become more hopeful is number one, find that one thing you're excited about and invest in it psychologically. That one thing you're excited about and invest in it psychologically. For some of you who are entrepreneurs, you always had that idea that you were gonna start a business and it just, it kind of gnawed at you. And then finally you had the time, energy, resources to start that business and it just took off. Okay, that's what hope feels like. So figuring out how to invest psychologically in that thing that excites you, that's step one. Step two is spend time with the most hopeful person you know. Spend time with the most hopeful person you know. If you've forgotten what hope feels like, hang out with someone who's hopeful all the time. And you will get that vibe off of them and you'll start acting like them to some extent. And that's, that's a way that I practice when I need a little more hope is I find the most hopeful people in my life. So my boss is this incredibly buoyant person. Um, she's, she's one of the four siblings that own Gallup and, and she and I just talk about the future and I just get so excited about it, okay? Now there's some other ways to kind of trigger hope. And all of you are going to do this, and none of you will admit it to me later, but here's one way. And we learned this from a marketing researcher. We are strangers to our future selves. And when we get to know our future selves, we start behaving in that person's best interests. Whether it comes to saving money, eating right, exercising, you name it. So follow me. We're strangers to our future selves. How can you get to know your future self? Take a picture of your future self. How do you do that? You go on your smartphone, you download an app that allows you to age your photo five, 10, 15 years, and then you hang out with that person, okay? So the original study was done with college students who were asked to age themselves 30 years. So another quick study. Oh God, 30 years. I said five, 10, you can do it different, all right. So I'm gonna divide up the room. You guys are freshmen again. You go into a study, and then I ask you to take a picture of yourself, and then you come out of the room, and that's all you do. You size it and crop it, and then you come out of the room, and I say, oh, we forgot to ask you one question. If I gave you $1,000, how much would you save toward retirement? And you're like, ah, oh, almost nothing. Um, so then <laughs> you guys, college students, freshmen, you go into the room, you take a picture of yourself, you crop it, and then you have one more direction. Hit this button, and you'll age yourself 30 years. And then they use that cool software, like on America's Most Wanted, and then you're aged 30 years. And then you look at it for a few seconds, the computer monitor goes off, you walk out of the room, I said, oh, I forgot to ask you a question. How much would you save toward retirement if I gave you $1,000 right now? Quite a bit, <laughs> quite a bit. I just met my future self, that guy needs some help. <laughs> That's how our mind works. 
when we get to know our future self, we start behaving in our best interest today. We start psychologically investing in the future and it pays off today. So I've done this and notice I am not showing you the picture of my 30 year old self, okay? Um, do it, it's fun, it's interesting. I, I encouraged a, a group at Johnson, excuse me, at uh, um, KU uh, campus down the street to do this and I knew, I knew it was gonna come back to haunt me. One woman said, you know, I'm a little older than the rest of the folks. Um, should I really do this? I said, yeah, give it a try. She comes back, she, you know, she engaged in the exercise, and she said, you know, I'm 86 now, and I look pretty good at 116. <laughs> so try that one, try that one on. But if you, if you can't do that, or if you don't want to do that, do you have someone in your life who is your future self? Do you have an aunt, an uncle, a friend, a neighbor, a preacher, someone who you're like, that, that's who I want to be. And I, I'm, I'm not too far away from that guy. Yeah, 30 years, but meaning if I live my life right, I think I'll have his life, which is a pretty good looking life. So my neighbor, Neil, is my future self. And he invited I'm driving over here today. I see the text message pop up. Yeah, he texts. He's in his 60s and he texts. Um, so he's cool like that. Um, I know. I, I don't text because I don't want to talk to people. But um, <laughs> so he, I get over here and I check the, my phone and he's, he's like, uh, you want to go to nerd night? A bunch of young people hang out and drink beer and talk about ideas. And he wants to go to nerd night. I'm like, no, I got this thing. Um, and that's who I want to be. I want to be curious. I want to be engaged. I want to be more in love with my wife than I am even now because he's just like gaga over his wife. I want to be all those things. So we spend time together. Those are two ways, okay? And the book has a whole host of ideas about how you can, how you can make yourself more hopeful. And I want you to do that for your good because you're going to do better in school, do better at work, you're going to be happier. If you're happier, you'll be healthier. We've done all those studies. But also, you'll have more hope to share. If you have hope to spare, you have hope to share. You can spread hope. You can be a more hopeful leader. You can be like Bev Chapman, the president of Spelman University, a college for mainly African-American women. In 2007, Bev's um, chief financial officer said, you know what? Something's happening in the markets, and we're, our foundations are going to shrink. Some of our girls will have a hard time paying bills. Let's start thinking about different things. And Bev said, you know what? You know what I'm going to do? Give me a name of all of our students who are about one year from graduation, and I'm going to go find people, and I'm going to say, this girl, this woman needs $10,000 to make it through school. She hasn't told me that yet, but she will. Sponsor this woman. So she created the Starfish Initiative, and she sponsored. She got other people to sponsor all these women. Sure enough, the recession hit. Alicia McClung was sitting in her dorm room saying, how am I going to pay? My parents are now out of work. They lost their retirement. I don't have any money. She wakes up in the morning. She sees this huge bill, you know, like $9,000 for her, her semester. It's like, what am I going to do? How am I going to do that? So she walks around campus and tries to just kind of figure it out and talks to herself and makes sense out of it. Said, okay, maybe I'll take a year off. She comes back, and she hadn't written down the number, so she wanted to get the precise number. She goes back on her page to find out how much she owed. Zero. Zero. Bev Chapman looked into the future and said, what will people around me need? Bev Chapman just cut all NCAA athletics at Spelman. Just did it in March. Why did she do it? They were spending $1 million to fund 99 athletes. $1 million to fund 99 athletes. Is that worth it? Maybe. I mean, some of these women were probably really developing and growing. But what she realized is that I have hundreds of women who need some well-being help right now. Diabetes, obesity, other problems. We're not going to address that by having sporting events. We're going to address it if I take that million dollars and create these well-being opportunities for all the women on campus. And you're going to see more and more of that kind of hopeful leadership from college presidents down the road. Teaching hope to the next generation. We're just two weeks out from having named the most hopeful teacher in America. 
two weeks ago. And her name is Mary Hawkins Jones. And she is a teacher in Montgomery County, Maryland, Montgomery County Public Schools. We have these students that complete the Gallup student poll. Last year, 500,000 students completed the Gallup student poll at 2,000 different schools. I did some analyses to find out which are our high hope schools. I found 175 of them. I called the principals. OK, other people called the principals. Um, we called the principals. We said, you know, this might sound odd, but we're, we're, we're basically announcing that you're a high hope school. And they're like, that is like the best award ever. And they just loved it. Can, the, the next question was, can we have a banner? We're like, <laughs> OK, we'll figure it out. And then the, our next question to them was, you know, this might be hard, but could you nominate, could you identify one person in your school that is your high hope teacher at your school? Because we want to we wanna get those folks to apply for an award and nominate one, identify one person who wins this award. And here's what I got over and over and over again. I could do that in a split second. I could do that in a heartbeat. I know exactly who I can nominate. We got all these nominations to the, together, and Mary Hawkins Jones won the award. So tomorrow, Google most hopeful teacher in America, and you will be like, oh, yeah, that's her. That's her. We interviewed tons of folks. We got down to three finalists. We did some more data diving on them, more interviews on them. And then we were like, she's it. She's it. And we had her over to DC. We gave her an award. And then that afternoon, we had a big education meeting. We've been doing the same poll on education for 43 years. And we said, you know what? Mary's in the building. We're going to have Mary as a panelist. And she's with these big wigs, Department of Education and all these fancy people. They all went gaga over Mary Hawkins Jones. They were like, this is education. This is education. The woman can teach like nobody's business. But more than that, she can want, have kids, she can make kids want to learn what she's teaching. And just story after story, the, the punctuation mark was, you know, I asked Mary, I said, tell me when you knew you were a hopeful teacher. And she said, my first year of school, I had this little, woman, little girl named Christina, first grade. Um, she didn't speak much English. She was from El Salvador. She just sat in the corner. She just looked scared. And I went to her, and I, 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 we made a connection. And then we started talking over time. I said, honey, what are you going to do when you grow up? She goes, I'm going to be a maid like all the other women in my family. And Mary said, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> you have to think you can do something more than that. And if you do that, that's fine. But you have to give yourself a shot at doing something more. This year, Christina won Montgomery County Public Schools Best Teacher Award. So 23 years later, Christina's a teacher in the same district. And we didn't know that when we picked Mary. And we were like, oh my gosh, that is amazing. OK, um, finally, networking hope. You know, we have to make sense out of our circles of influence. And then we have to figure out, how can I get hope from me to that person, to that person, to that person, to that person? And one guy already figured it out for us. And this was Robert Kennedy. And in your packets, you have this quote. But I just think it's a great quote. I think it's a great quote. There are many reasons why I like Robert Kennedy quotes. Um, this one was from a speech he made in South Africa. Um, it's called the boys' speech that he made in South Africa. There's another speech that he made right after Martin Luther King was killed in Indianapolis, I believe. And then there was his stump speech that he made at lots of college campuses when he was running for president that talks about well-being and what should be factored into happiness and what we measure. Should we measure gross domestic, ha uh, pa um, gross domestic uh, productivity or should we measure other things like gross domestic happiness. So that speech he actually gave at Lawrence, Kansas in the field house, which is really cool. Um, but this speech just blows me away. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. So please, go make ripples. Thank you. Are you ready? We've received a good number of questions. I'm sorry, 
we won't have time to address each and every one of them, but I do have an announcement first for you, Shane. There's a question for you. Yep. Did you know that there is a walk for the penguins at the Kansas City Zoo on October the 5th? No. Hey, there's a helpful hint That's for you. That's great. I love penguins. <laughs> Off that same card, someone would like to know, how do you relate memories of the future with expectations? Yeah, there, there certainly are related. Um, Memories of the future are deeper than expectations. So expectations can be somewhat fleeting. In other words, someone says, um, well, the Chiefs win this weekend. And you don't have a huge investment in the Chiefs, but you can think about, OK, who are they playing? Who are they playing, by the way? Oh, Lord. Oh. Um, so, oh. <laughs> so then based on the information you have, you create this rational assessment, and you, you kind of chime in with an expectation. So, Expectations are kind of this rational deduction of how things will work out, okay? Memories of the future have a little bit of that in them, but there's an emotional piece too, because you extend the memory, the more excited and intriguing it is, okay? So that's why sometimes, you know, when I still try to think about um, being a uh, shortstop for the Boston Red Sox, <laughs> at some point, I realize, well, now I'm just fantasizing. Okay, so I can build those memories, but then they kind of lose their, their zest. Expectations are more the rational side of things where you're assessing the likelihood of something to happen. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Shane, you talked a great deal about sharing hope with others. For those caring for elderly parents, mm -hmm. how can we make hope happen for them? Yeah, I just got a call um, a couple of days ago from a friend named Tom, and Tom's dad um, has diabetes, um, among other ailments, and he had to have a leg amputated some months back. And he was just recovering from that, and now it appears that he needs to have his foot, his remaining foot, amputated. So he was asking me the same question, and I deal with that in my own life with, with my, my folks. Um, they need, just like all of us, something to look forward to every three or four days every three or four days. So for Tom, he said, you know what, I pulled some strings, I got dad a Mayo appointment. I said, okay, they're up in Minnesota. He said, I said, that's, is he excited about that? So dad's looking forward to this Mayo appointment. Um, so then the next, I said, what's the next thing? And he said, well, my, my daughter has a tennis tournament. My dad loves watching her play tennis. I said, can you get him there? He goes, absolutely. You know, and then we started, we, we made it about two weeks out. I said, Tom, you're gonna have to do this. This is your part-time job. You've got to create something more for your dad to look forward to. So that's a start. You have to create that excitement. But then they also have to be connected to very hopeful people, and that's not always you, because you can kind of tire out and burn out and get a little cranky when you're caring for someone else for a long time. So somehow you have to find that most hopeful caregiver who can spend a few hours a week with them. Put those two things together, you'll get a little bit of momentum. Great, thank you. Two questions about the same, or two, yeah, so I'll just ask. Um, can you describe how school districts are using this HOPE work, mm -hmm. this HOPE work, and there's someone who wants to know explicitly with regards to middle school students, um, the drive-in agency to develop plan, yeah. a plan to get them from point A to point B. So today I was on the phone when, when we met today, Debbie, I was on the phone with uh, Connecticut um, Department of Education. So their legislators said every student in Connecticut needs a student success plan. They legislated it. So every student in Connecticut's coming up with a student success plan in conjunction, you know, under the tutelage of advisors and teachers. And part of that has to do with where they want to be in the future. Part of that has to do with how engaged are they today. So they're baking that into the plan. And I've been telling them, and we're almost to the point where they're going to add it to the plan, but not quite there. You know, I want pictures of what that child's good job and happy family will look like. If it's a third grader, give them crayons, let them draw it. If it's a 10th grader, have them take pictures with their smartphone. Um, if you think about what, if you watch a little TV and you see Prudential, Principal, Nationwide, all these different companies that want you to invest in insurance or retirement, they're telling you, go meet your future self and that will help you save money today. And I think if we're able to do that with students, then we can drive some of the, the hope and agency, uh, the hope and engagement. But middle school, I joked earlier, middle school, based on our data, 
it's as hopeful as, students are as hopeful as they are in elementary or high school, but they're much less engaged. From fifth grade to sixth grade to seventh grade to eighth grade, engagement goes down precipitously, precipitously. But even in eighth grade, when engagement among students is the lowest, guess who they're more engaged than? They're teachers. So we did a study of American teachers, published that about a month ago, and about 31% of American teachers are engaged at work, 31. Even at the lowest point, students are about 40%. On average, they run at about 60% engagement. So students out-engage their teachers, by and large, in America. So that's something we need to kind of pay attention to as well. The newest teachers were most engaged. The, the teachers who had been on job the longest were least engaged. And of course, the teachers that had disappeared um, had gotten to the point where they were actively disengaged or are not engaged at all, and they just left the profession. Let's not end on that note, by the way. No, we won't. Okay, we have good. More. <laughs> we have more, and we have a few more minutes. Have you looked at how hope affects those with mental illness? Sure, sure. Um, in fact, so, it, you know, there's so many different illnesses to think about, and the DSM-28 just came out. Um, it's the DSM-5, but, you know. Um, you know, hope and, and PTSD are linked. So the latest hope study that came out was looking at hope and post-traumatic uh, stress disorder among veterans in a VA clinic. And they were using not a HOPE intervention, but they were using a documented, effective PTSD intervention, but tracking to determine what led to the decreases in anxiety and stress symptoms over time. Everybody with me? So you're giving folks with PTSD a documented, effective intervention, and they were wondering, now, what's the real change mechanism here? Why is this intervention working? And what they found out is that hope goes up during that intervention and symptoms go down. Now, with stats, we can do all the modeling and we can demonstrate whether, it, we can test whether, oh, symptoms went down and that's why hope went up, or hope went up and then symptoms went down. And it was the latter. Hope went up and symptoms went down. So hope is the change mechanism. Hope is the change mechanism, whether it comes to PTSD and other stress disorders, depression and cognitive behavioral therapy, which treats um, um, uh, those kinds of uh, disorders. Um, when we get into psychosis, it's, it's a harder game um, because there, there aren't great treatments for psychosis beyond medication. But even medication has, has kind of a hope effect to it. Um, if you believe your medication will work, you're more likely to have medication that works. Um, so you kind of bake in the placebo effect to some extent. Do you need a drink? You okay? You go ahead. <laughs> Two questions around business and business plan and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So we'll just kind of combine them. Uh, what role does hope play in entrepreneurship? Yeah. And then talk a little bit too about hope with regards to that business plan. Sure. Um, so just this morning, I don't, I don't know if you spend a lot of time in Lawrence, but there's this little funky shop called the Arizona Trading Company, downtown Lawrence. So. Uh, Jen Sievers owns that company, and Jen was driving from her house um, down to her shop, and she passes our house, and she, she breaks about seven laws and pulls over, and <laughs> we're chatting. And she's chatting with her husband, who owns a winery in Walla Walla, Washington, and lives in Walla Walla, Washington. And they have a son, real name, Tiger, <laughs> who plans to be an entrepreneur. Tiger's not. These folks are, are hope personified. I mean, it's a family of entrepreneurs. Her parents were entrepreneurs. His parents were entrepreneurs. Um, hope's, uh, entrepreneurism is not in the genes, but hope can be passed down from generation to generation. So no one in the history of entrepreneurship ever woke up one morning and said, you know what, I'm going to start this business. I'm going to put all my money into it. I'm going to put all my energy into it for years, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be a failure. <laughs> no one ever does that. Now, hopeful people sometimes go out of business. Hope is not a panacea or a cure-all. I mean, hope doesn't always sustain you in tough economic times, but you're more likely to get through tough economic times if you're a hopeful entrepreneur than if you're a less hopeful entrepreneur. So hope is part of entrepreneurism. In fact, um, oh man, I'm blanking. Michael is the president of this wonderful college in Kansas that's focused on entrepreneurism. Help me out. Ma, 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 ma. It'll come to me. In Kansas? No. 
Nope. <laughs> It'll come to me. Small college. I want to say Marymount. Marymount? Nope. It'll come. That's all right. It won't come to me. Um, <laughs> anyway, they are attracting bachelor students who want to start businesses. That's all they do. They're a little liberal arts college. That's all they do. And Michael said, I guess we only need to attract the hopeful ones. I said, yeah, <laughs> that's it. So, yeah, hope is part and parcel. Um, when it comes to a business plan, you know, you still have to put the business plan together. So my friend Jay, who's an amazing cook, is finally coming up with a business plan for his own food truck. And, you know, he's a hopeful guy. But Jay said, you know, that doesn't, that's not everything. I've got to come up with all these ways to make money during the, the down season. I've got to come up with all these solutions uh, to problems. Um, I tell a story about Kristen uh, in the book who started the first and only food truck in Paris. Mm -hmm. The first and only food truck in Paris. People said, you know what? People don't eat food on, while walking like they do in America. They sit down. She said, that's a problem. We're going to figure that out. People said, there are no food trucks in Paris. We don't even have regulations to, to deal with this. We'll figure that out. So she calls herself the chief problem solver, mm -hmm. okay? And what's beautiful is that she's selling burgers. And she has sold out every day since she opened. And it's a mix of, of French folks who just love what she's doing and Americans who are in Paris, they just flock to her. So hope can be measured. Hope can be measured. So you can go online. So the other side of your Ripple's quote is um, a link. You know, it talks about hopemonger.com. And the first thing you can do there is take the, the hope survey. And we use one that's pretty actionable. Rick Snyder developed one that we use in research. Then we developed another one for the Gallup student poll. So absolutely, at Gallup, we can measure anything. You throw out <laughs> a topic, you know, I'll tell you I can measure it by tomorrow morning. So, um, you know, hope we've really done a pretty good job of measuring over the last 20 years. Is out-of-the-box thinking that I've been doing all of my life connected to being a hope seeker or hope raiser? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, hope out-of-the-box thinking is that creative thinking and, and it's that innovative thinking. And, and it comes from believing that you can have an impact on things and people in the world. And then you come up with multiple solutions. So out-of-the-box thinking, I think, gets you to the pathways part of hope. So if you believe the future will be better than the present, that's goals thinking. I'll give you a quick acronym. That's goals thinking. Pathways thinking is coming up with multiple solutions, and that's partly out of the box thinking. And then agency thinking is the I think I can, I think I can, I think I can thinking. So if you want to sum up hope in the components, they're GPA. Goals thinking plus pathways thinking plus agency thinking. Now going back to my statement that optimism is half of hope, that's kind of goals thinking is kind of partly optimism. And then the power to get things done is pathways and agency. Okay, thank you, yeah. thank you. I believe that's all we have time for because we yeah. do want to uh, get you out to the book table, the book signing. You bet. Uh, books are available for sale through the JCCC bookstore. Just, I think directionally, I'm I'm challenged. To the left. To the left, down by the Yardley Hall. We're going to let Shane get a drink of water, but let's again thank him for sharing his insight with us. Thank you all.